Well, a warm welcome to today's video. Hi, I'm Jane Jackson, a studier and practitioner of all things metaphysical. This is one of a series of videos from Spirit of the Rainbow. And today we're looking at the light of the Cathars with Simon Honoré, author, historian, Simon, welcome. Hi. I'd like to start, who were the Cathars and what was their mission? Well, they were a spiritual movement uh, running across mostly Southern Europe. That's from Bulgaria in the East through to Bosnia, Northern Italy, Southern France, particularly the area called the Long Dock. I should say from the start that they weren't called Cathars at the time. In the Middle Ages, they were known as the good Christians, the good men, good women. And this gives us our first clue about their mission, which was to remain faithful to the original teachings and practices of Jesus and his early followers. So we can see this, for example, in their rituals. They had something called the blessing of bread. Now, the Cathars very often ate together. Bread would be brought in. A Cathar parfait, that's to say an initiated Cathar, roughly equivalent to a priest, would bless the bread. They would say the Lord's Prayer over it. The bread would be distributed. Now, what's interesting is that we know that that ritual goes back to the very early Christian church at a time before what is now the Eucharist Holy Communion has become a formalized ceremony. But it wasn't just about preserving ancient practices. They viewed themselves as the true church. That is to say, those who tried to follow the example of Jesus and his apostles, living lives of simplicity, lives without material wealth, lives of healing and teaching, helping people in so many ways. Now, the official church, that's to say the Catholic Church in the West and the Orthodox Christian Church in the East, denounced them as being heretics. That's to say people who didn't follow the official doctrines. But the Cathars weren't really about doctrines. They were about the life, about living the life. And so their mission essentially was to show people, to show everyone that we could all follow Jesus' example. So when you look at this, it, it seems as if they very much were far more interested in an experiential life than one that was of intellect or the theosophy of the church. So it's a very different approach that we have. Okay, you call this video the light of the Cathars. What do you mean by the light of the Cathars? Again, we need to go right back to Jesus for this. The first thing to understand is that Jesus was, as it says in the scriptures, the light of the world. And that wasn't just a metaphor. That was literally true. They was an enormous spiritual light that spread from Jesus across the world. Now, it was an invisible light. You would have to have highly developed intuitive senses even to experience it, let alone see it. But it radiated across the world. It lifted up the spiritual vibration of the world, lifted up humanity. Now, the Cathars, in essence, trying to reflect some of that Christ's light. Um, they had come together in what is called a group incarnation. In other words, it wasn't just random individuals bumping into each other in the Middle Ages and joining a movement. These were souls that had been prepared through many lifetimes for this work, what you might call a sole purpose of spreading this light. And so... They're working together, incarnating at this time in the Middle Ages. 
And for all this to work, it was essential that they, like Jesus, attained a level of purity. That's, that's very interesting because part of my work involves taking people back to past life regressions. And very often I see people and it seems to me that we're all trying to get back to this higher consciousness, this higher understanding of who we are and what we bring to the world. Um, I'd like to move on a little bit more. Can you explain to me what do you mean by the purity um, of the cathars? So the best analogy I can give was, was given to me by the spiritual teacher Omram Mikhailov, about which we will hear more later. If you look at the picture here of the lamps, now, for a lamp to shine, the glass has to be clean, like you can see in the inset with the three lamps. But if the glass is dirty, as you can see in the main picture, then the light is dull. So essentially, purity means that the cathars, that Jesus, that we need to clean up our own act spiritually for the light to shine through. We need to remove impurities. Now, every generation will have its own understanding of that. If we look today, we might talk about freeing ourselves from the enslavement of addiction. We might talk about removing uh, any psychic impurities or interference that we've had we might think in terms about the purity of our motives. In Jesus's case, he was a being of astonishing purity through which then the Christ light could shine. So the principle of purity is key for understanding the Cathars mission. See this interestingly, I see this a lot within the work that I do when people take down their worries, their fears, their anxieties, all of this when they stop trying to impress, the the gentler they get, the nicer they get. So it is very much like polishing the lamps. And to use another metaphor, to borrow another metaphor for this, it's the same as hitting the nail on the head. The more we clean up our own act, the more spiritually aware we seem to become and life seems to become much easier and happier. Just carrying on from this, what, what can we learn from the reaction of the church? Well, the church in general and the Pope in particular became increasingly frustrated. If we take a case study of the Languedoc, southern France, for example, they carried on a program of preaching and public debate with the Cathars on and off for about 100 years, culminating in a sort of grand tour in 1206 to 7, uh, in which the monks from the church, preachers from the church, tried to imitate the Cathar lifestyle. Uh, and they won quite a few debates, but the problem was it didn't matter how many theological victories they uh, scored because it wasn't the doctrine of the Cathars that attracted people. It was their way of life. It was their example. It was their light. So it didn't really have much uh, impact. Now, as we come up to the year 1200, a new pope came to the throne, Innocent III. He was a very dynamic character and was very impatient. One of the things he did was issue a decree, the Vergentis, which basically said that anyone committing an act of heresy was as serious a crime as treason against the Roman emperor, which kind of raised the stakes. And then he sent a, a, a papal team to remonstrate with the local nobles in the Languedoc who he thought were being too soft on Cathars. And there was a clash 
between the head of a team and one of the great magnates, following which the papal representative was assassinated. I hasten to add, not by a Cathar parfait, because they were sworn to non-violence, but by an overzealous knight who had misunderstood the wishes of his master. Anyway, Pope Innocent unleashed a fury, a 20-year crusade, the Albigensian crusade, all over the Languedoc, or terrible massacres and so on. Even at the end of that crusade, Cathars were still strong, support was still strong. So they then introduced what was called the Inquisition, which was basically to seek out, arrest, bring to trial, and punish those who they deemed heretics. That's to say, the Cathars. And then a price was put on Cathars' head. Uh, officials were given the right to enter any home if they suspected they were hiding a Cathar to search everywhere and destroy it if a Cathar was found. Uh, local nobles that had been supporting the Cathars, or at least turning a blind eye to the Cathars, lost their lands or they were forced to sign an agreement in which not only would they stop supporting Cathars, but they would persecute them. So as a result of all this in the long dock by 1321, the last Cathar parfait was burnt alive. Similar situation in Spain and in Italy, they hung on a little bit longer. So in these increasingly violent and systematic ways, the church reacted to what they perceived as the threat of these good Christians, these Cathars. It seems to me when, when we look at all of this that the church really is threatened and frightened by what it sees. Because here we have, we've got them, you know, the church is coming along, it's giving the doctrines, and the Cathars are going, well, we're not really interested in that. They've created a military campaign, and that still hasn't got rid of them. It hasn't got rid of the support. The Cathars have women sitting equally within the priesthood, so that didn't sit well. And they're also saying, well, we're, we're the un unbroken line down from Jesus and the apostles. So all of this felt very uncomfortable, I think, for the, for the church and the papacy. And they came in with a very heavy handed, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to suppress them. This is how we're going to annihilate them. And they followed through with it. So what happened to the Cathars after this? Well, the first thing I would say is the spiritual light is immensely powerful. And if it's blocked here on earth, even if the light bearers are exterminated, it will find another route, like water. If we think of the individual souls of the Cathars, whether they died of natural causes or at the hands of the Crusade or the Inquisition, it's rather like a flock of birds. They, they leave together and find new grounds. And both these streams then met, it is said, at the beginning of the 20th century in Bulgaria, a place where Catharism is often believed to have started. Now, the Bulgarian spiritual teacher, Peter Dernov, you can see a picture of him here, began a movement, he called it the Universal White Brotherhood, and he said that was in direct line with the Cathars. He also said that many of the souls of the original Cathars had reincarnated during the 20th century and joined his movement. And the third thing he said was that one of the mistakes the Cathars made was to try and fight evil, which just gave it more power. And what we must learn to do is very much focus on the good and building the good. Now, just before the Second World War, he sent one of his disciples, Mikhail Ivanov, again, you'll see his picture there, 
to France. So parallel movement to what happened in the Middle Ages. Mikhail Ivanov set up a center just outside Paris, another one in the south of France. Now, we look at this picture. In 1977, the guy in this picture, that's me as was, joined the movement and spent 10 years learning its teaching and practices before I moved on with my spiritual exploration, wrote some books and found the spirit of the rainbow. One of the curious things is that unknowingly, some of that legacy filtered down into Spirit of the Rainbow's own values and principles, and you'll see them written there. So we focus on what we are for rather than what we are against. We use both our intuition and our intellect in our work. We value our experience over any dogma. So you might say in one way, the cycle has become completed now. Thank you for this seminar. What I take from this is actually, we all come from different perspectives, different ideas, but the more that we do the shining of our own lamps, the, shine, the looking, looking at ourselves, the lighter and the brighter the world will become. So thank you so much for this. Uh, if anybody would like some more information on Simonon and his work, please go to spiritoftherainbow.org. And if you take a look on the homepage, you'll find a link which will take you to Spirit of the Rainbow YouTube channel where there's more videos on the Cathars. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like some more information from me, please go to lightworkenergy.com and thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.